So let's look at the accessory structures of the integumentary system. So these would be the hair and the nails. Uh, it turns out that both hair and nails are derived from the epidermis, that is, they're, they're made essentially of epidermal tissue. They are different from the epidermis in that they are composed of a hard keratin, which has the advantages of being tougher and more durable than the soft keratin that we see in the epidermis. Hard keratin also prevents individual cells that make up the hair or the nails from flaking off, and so this gives a, much, a lot more structure and rigidity to the hair and to the nails that we just don't see in the skin. Uh, but that's necessary in these structures in order for them to accomplish their function. So let's start first with hairs and then we'll briefly turn our attention to nails. Uh, it turns out that hairs can be classified as either vellus hairs or terminal hairs. Uh, the body hair of children and adult females is a very fine pale hair that we call vellus hair. Um, so these hairs tend to have very little pigment in them and they tend to be very small and kind of very delicate essentially. The coarser and longer hair of the eyebrows, uh, the eyelashes, and the scalp is what we call terminal hair, and terminal hair is often darker than vellus hair, so, um, so it often has more pigment in it. Uh, melanin, which is the pigment that gives our skin its color, is also the same pigment that gives our hair its color as well. Uh, it turns out that at puberty, too, uh, terminal hairs appear in the axillary and the pubic regions of both uh, males and females, uh, and on the face and the chest, uh, and typically even the arms and legs of males as well. And so we get terminal hairs appearing uh, after puberty as well. Uh, the Terminal hairs of males in particular, uh, or I should say just of any sex, uh, male or female, uh, terminal hairs grow in response to the effects of androgens, that is male sex hormones like testosterone. Uh, and so terminal hairs are actually stimulated by testosterone production. Uh, even females, uh, even though females don't have uh, testes, which produce the bulk of testosterone for men, uh, females still uh, produce uh, testosterone in uh, their adrenal glands, which are these small pyramid-shaped glands that sit on top of the kidney. And so the adrenal glands then kind of become the most important source of testosterone for women, uh, whereas testes tend to be the, the main producer of uh, testosterone in males. So let's look at hair function, since we're focusing on hair for a second here. The hair, uh, its main function in humans is to sense insects or parasites on the skin before they bite or they sting us. Uh, hair on the scalp helps to guard the head against physical trauma. Uh, it, it helps to mitigate heat loss or prevent heat loss, um, or at least slow heat loss, uh, especially when it's cold outside. And it also protects the top of the scalp from sunlight, so it acts as a sunshade in that regard. Uh, eyelashes function to shield the eyes. And nose hairs uh, that line the kind of the entrance to the nasal cavity uh, end up filtering or have the function of filtering large particles like dust, debris, uh, and things like that uh, from the air when we are breathing. Uh, as far as hair anatomy goes, we'll focus on four regions of the hair. Uh, three of them you can see here. Uh, we'll focus on the hair shaft, the hair root, the hair bulb, and, oh, actually, you can see the fourth one here. That's the, um, that's the uh, outer epidermal and connective tissue layers that surround the hair itself, and that's referred to as the hair follicle. So we'll focus on these four regions of the hair. Uh, let's briefly define these, though, uh, just so we know uh, what each of these terms means in terms of anatomy of a hair, uh, a, a, a single hair. So the hair shaft is the part of the hair that projects above the skin surface, while the hair root is actually embedded within the skin itself. So the hair shaft is the part that we can see, the hair root is the part that we can't see that's embedded uh, within the skin. Hair follicles are a folding of epidermal tissue down into the dermis, and hair follicles tend to wrap and surround the superficial surface uh, of the hair root. 
Uh, and finally, the hair bulb is the is referring to the expanded end or the expanded deeper end of the hair follicle. So the hair bulb tends to be at the deepest locations uh, of the hair uh, within the um, with kind of deep within the dermis there. We also see that there are hair follicle receptors and hair follicle receptors are these uh, sensory nerve endings that wrap around each individual hair bulb and they function as essentially uh, they detect motion so that is when the hairs are bent or when the hairs are moved these sensory nerve endings uh, are stimulated and send that information to the brain and usually when hairs are bent it means that something like a small insect is crawling on us and so that essentially alerts us to the fact that there is something on the surface of our skin that could potentially harm us. So looking kind of deep within the uh, deep within the dermis at the hair bulb, we see that there is a dermal papilla that's called the hair papilla. Uh, this hair papilla contains a cluster of capillaries that brings nutrients to the, the deeper part of the hair here. There's also a layer of cells that's within the follicle itself, and this, this layer of cells is called the hair matrix. And the hair matrix is essentially very similar to the stratum basale that we saw in the epidermis. Uh, the hair matrix, uh, the cells within the hair matrix undergo mitosis, and this causes the hair to grow longer because what happens is that old hair cells are pushed upward as new hair cells are made from the hair matrix. Now, hairs grow an average of about two millimeters per week or so, but this is only an average and this rate tends to vary pretty widely among the different body regions, even on the same person, but also um, it also varies with individual, it, in, it varies with gender, male or female, right, and age as well. Hair pigment uh, is made by melanocytes that are found at the base of the hair follicle. Uh, the melanin that's made by the melanocytes, these are the same melanocytes that give our skin pigment. Uh, this melanin that's produced is transferred to nearby hair cells that are being pushed superficially. Uh, we see that different concentrations of melanin produce hair in essentially a range of colors, anyway from like very light blonde, almost like a kind of a white color, to brown, uh, dark browns, and even black hair. Uh, red hair is colored by a pigment that's called pheomelanin, so it's pretty... Um, it's pretty similar in terms of structure, only differing in color uh, compared to uh, melan the brown-black pigment uh, that we know as melanin. So it turns out that as we age, um, melanin production tends to decrease in the, uh, in the melanocytes at the base of the hair. And air bubbles actually replace the melanin that's in the cells in the hair uh, shaft. And so because we're lacking melanin and air bubbles are now filling those hair cells, uh, this causes the hair to turn either a gray color or a white color. And so that's why hair ends up turning gray or white as we age, because we our melanin production slows down and eventually stops. So those are the structures of our hairs. Let's turn our attention briefly to nails here. Uh, nails form a clear protective covering on the dorsal surface of our fingers or our toes. Uh, in humans, nails are really helpful uh, for us to uh, to scratch things that may be on our skin. They're helpful as small to as tools to help us pry up and lift up small objects and things like that. And so, nails help us uh, in function in those ways. A couple of structures we'll look at with the nail. We'll see the nail. Uh, we look at the nail plate. Uh, it's also called the body of the nail. This is the visible portion of the nail that's attached to uh, the skin. The nail root is embedded within the skin and it's surrounded by a, uh, a layer of uh, epithelial cells that are called the nail matrix. Uh, now we just saw the hair matrix that's responsible for hair growth. In the same way, the nail matrix is responsible for growth of the nail. And so new nail cells are produced here that pushes old nail cells forward instead of superficially pushes them forward and that's what causes the nail to grow longer. Uh, typically in healthy individuals the nail tends to appear pink because the nail is clear 
uh, but we can see the the abundance of capillary beds and the blood that's flowing through those capillary beds uh, in the dermis underneath the nail. And so that's what causes the nail to appear kind of a pinkish color. Of course, the end of it is, is white in color because uh, there's no dermal tissue under it to give it pigment. Um, but really what we're seeing is like, if you think of the, the nail plate itself as kind of a sort of opaque window looking down into the, down into the dermal tissue, uh, the, the blood vessels uh, and the blood that those blood vessels are carrying is what gives the nail its pinkish pigment uh, on the, the nail plate itself. Uh, and it actually turns out that nail color is pretty important because uh, changes in nail color, changes in nail appearance are often signs of disease and that can help clinicians diagnose uh, very specific conditions. Even when it doesn't seem like anything else is going wrong in the body, the nails uh, are a really good visible indicator that something internally is going wrong.